Hello again, I'm Sam B. Hansen. Over the next two videos, I'm going to be playing my way through the whole of Debussy's first book of preludes. Uh, there are 12 preludes in the book. I'm going to play the first five today and the other seven next week. And I mentioned last week um, that there was a reason for the uneven split that I've chosen to adopt in these two videos. And that is that I wanted to keep preludes six, seven and eight together as a set. Um, it's quite nice to do that. Um, the reason for that is that Prelude 7 is the most frantic and dramatic um, of all the Preludes in the book, and it's surrounded, possibly quite deliberately, on Debussy's part by two of the calmest in Prelude 6 and 8, and I thought it'd be nice to, to keep those together in the same video. Um, it also um, allows me to finish today with the joyful and lively Prelude number 5, as you'll hear later. Um, Debussy wrote two books of 12 preludes each. Uh, the first, which I'll be playing in these two videos, was published in 18, um, sorry, April 1910, and the other in April 1913. Um, this total of 24 preludes uh, may have been inspired by Chopin, who also wrote 24 preludes, one for each major and minor key. And he himself was probably influenced by J.S. Bach, in his well-tempered clavier or 48 preludes and fugues where he does the same thing. He takes um, one piece, well two pieces really, because he's got 48 preludes and fugues uh, for each of the 24 major and minor keys. Um, a word about Debussy's titles. Usually we'd expect the title of a piece of music to be written at the top of the score, at the beginning of the score. Um, Debussy writes the title of each of his preludes um, instead at the end at the end of the score, in brackets, as a kind of little afterthought, um, and perhaps to give the player or listener the opportunity to form their own impression of the piece before Debussy's title is revealed. And so with that in mind, I'm going to talk about each piece after I've played it to give you a chance to have a think about what you think um, it might be about or what, what the inspiration for each one might have been. And so let's start with prelude number one.
Some of the chords in that piece remind me of Carnival of the Animals by Camille Sasson, another French composer, um, particularly the movement from that piece, the cuckoo in the depths of the woods. Um, some of you may have heard that before. I wonder if you drew similar comparisons. Um, Debussy's title for that prelude was Dancers of Delphi, um, named after a sculpture of three figures on top of a column, uh, which was discovered, uh, found near the sanctuary of Pythian Apollo at Delphi um, in Greece, and is now on display at the Delphi Archaeological Museum. Here's prelude number two.
Now apart from a short section which uses the pentatonic scale, the bit that went all of that. We've talked about the pentatonic scale briefly before that uses five notes and can be traced on the black notes of the keyboard. Um, apart from that short section and a few chromatic bits here and there, the whole of that piece used what's called the whole tone scale. The chromatic scale, which I've mentioned before as well in previous videos, is where you take a note and play all the notes available to you, one after the other, in succession up or down the keyboard. And the distance from one to the next is called a semitone. A whole tone is simply two semitones. And if you play all tones, you get a scale with six notes in it before it starts to repeat. And that has a certain air of mystery about it, I suppose, which Debussy uses to great effect um, in Prelude Number no. 2. That prelude, uh, the original French title was Voile, which can translate into English as either veils or sails. Um, although, according to Edgard Varese, um, who was acquainted with Debussy, um, this piece is supposed to depict the long, uh, trailing silk veils of the American dancer Louis Fuller. And I quite like the, the imagery of that, of the of veils over sails. Um, you might think differently. Um, prelude number three is a bit quicker than the first two that we've heard so far. That ostinato figure in that last prelude, that figure that keeps repeating itself throughout the piece in various different guises, um, it could be something busy, perhaps like a bee maybe, um, or a wasp, or something less tangible, perhaps some, just some sort of tension that we get from the, the semitones between those, between those pairs of notes. Debussy's title for that piece is The Wind in the Plain. Um, 
and there's that sort of activity you can hear there through, throughout the piece, uh, which wasn't in the first two preludes. Prelude 4 is a return, um, however, to the gentleness of the first two preludes. That probably is one of my favourites from the book, and the title um, is a quote from a poem by Charles Baudelaire. Um, the poem is called Harmonie du Soir, Evening Harmony, and the quote, which forms the title of the prelude, translates as sounds and scents turn in the evening air. Um, and towards the end of the, the score, Debussy even writes the instruction like a distant ring of horns for these chords that we heard. Those consecutive chords moving up and down there. Um, finally for today, here's the more lively and joyful prelude number five.
I hope you enjoyed that. I thought it'd be nice to finish with that one uh, today. Debussy's title for Prelude Number no. 5, you've just heard, was The Hills of Anna Capri. Um, Anna Capri being found in Italy um, and no doubt inspired uh, Debussy by um, its very beautiful and elevated views across the hills and the, and the water um, in, in Italy. Um, that's it for today. Next week, which will be Friday the 13th of November 2020, I'll be playing through the rest of the book, the remaining seven preludes in the book. The week after that, which will be Friday the 20th, was going to be an organ video at St Peter's Church Hammersmith once again, um, but the second lockdown, which has just begun yesterday, um, might make that a little bit difficult. And if it does, I might still make it an organ video, but I may well be playing it from here. Um, and because I don't have a pedal board here, what I would be doing is playing the hand and feet part separately, those two parts separately, and multi-tracking myself. So you'll see me on the screen twice. Um, you'll see what I mean in a couple of weeks' time uh, for that video there. Um, but for today, in the meantime, thanks very much for watching, and see you next time.